This is a guide to orient residents to teaching in clinical settings. There are four key points in this guide to teaching in a clinical setting. The first is we're going to apply BDA to clinical teaching. This is a basic approach, which is easy to remember. We're also going to use RHYME framework by Pinjaro to determine what role the student should play in a given encounter. And we want to emphasize two other points. One is that it's important to offer autonomy to students in patient encounters, but do it strategically based upon your determination of what they know and can do. And you also want to challenge them uh, and push their limits and encourage the students to go beyond what they're currently capable of so that they can develop new knowledge and skills. Often, teaching in a clinical setting seems unstructured. BDA is a basic approach that's easy to recall that can help you provide a little bit more structure and deliberate thought to the learning experience. BDA stands for before, during, and after, and these terms apply to before the clinical encounter, during, and after the clinical encounter. These are things that you as an instructor can do to help the learner gain as much as they can from the clinical experience. Before the clinical encounter, there are a few things you can do to help establish expectations for the student's participation in the clinical encounter. The first thing is to be explicit about what you expect the student to be doing when they're in the patient's room. This will avoid confusion. Students might stand against the wall and believe their role is simply to watch or observe procedures, whereas you might expect them to step up and participate more actively. To avoid this confusion, we establish expectations with some specificity. But how do you know what to tell the student that they should be doing when they're engaged in a particular encounter? Well, we start by determining the student's knowledge and procedural abilities. For example, we start with a knowledge check. A knowledge check is just what it sounds like. We're determining what the student knows or is capable of doing, and we ask in relation to what we would like them to be able to do when participating in clinical encounters. So we could ask the student, how do we determine sepsis? And continuing on with this emergency medicine scenario, we could ask, what are the SERS criteria? How do they indicate sepsis? We could also ask, what are the QSOFIS criteria? To whom do they apply? We should also ask, how do we know when to apply SERS or QSOFA? Under what circumstances would we prefer one or the other? And are these both equally accepted and valid methods of assessing possible sepsis? Finally, we might explore with the student how they would apply the criteria to the particular patient. Asking questions like that helps us establish what the student knows and can do with no assistance or with some assistance, and we'll know then what our role should be. Or should we let the student go off to the patient's room alone? Are we confident in their knowledge and ability to do that? Uh, or do we believe that we should limit their role while they're in with the patient alone and then step into the room to guide them for the balance of the encounter? Another tool we can use to help us determine the specific role the student should perform in the patient encounter is the RHYME framework by Panjaro. The RHYME framework is R-I-M-E, and it stands for Reporter, Interpreter, Manager, and Educator for Integral Roles Doctors Perform Every Day. So based upon the conversation we've had with the student about what they know and what they're able to do, we can then use RHYME to help us determine which role the student should enact. Do we want them to serve primarily as a reporter of information, that is to collect and report relevant information about the patient and their situation? Should we ask them 
to become an interpreter of information. In other words, to review the patient history, the clinical data, and weigh the evidence in helping us to arrive at a differential. Is the student at a point in their knowledge and ability where they can help us to identify and manage resources or locate resources, or perhaps suggest appropriate actions in developing a plan of care? And then finally, is the student able to provide some peer education or some patient education or to contribute to that process? So the precaution is we do want to provide students with autonomy, but we want to be strategic about it. So we do our knowledge check. We can use RHYME to help us determine the role so that before sending your student off to see a patient, use the knowledge check and the RHYME role check to help you decide whether the student should observe and report assist in the procedure or examination of the patient, assist in patient care management, or engage in peer or patient education. Another key point we want to make is to remember to challenge your student. If you're not challenging your student, then you're not pushing them to learn anything new. But with this comes a precaution. You want to make sure the challenge is not too great, too above and beyond what the student knows or is capable of doing so that it sets them up for failure. That's why we do the knowledge check. So let's talk for a moment about what we can do during clinical encounters. Well, first of all, we should strategically offer students autonomy during patient encounters. Uh, this is part of challenging them to do something slightly beyond what they're currently capable of, but not so beyond the realm of possibility. We also need to be sure to observe the student during a patient encounter so we get a first-hand uh, sense of their ability to interact comfortably with patients. Observing them before we send them out autonomously to see patients is really the best practice. So basically, we need to gauge the level of autonomy for each student. It's never the same. Some are very dependent uh, on us to tell them what we expect them to do and how to do it and so on. And others are a little bit more self-sufficient. We always want to aim for independence, but start with guidance. So let's talk a little bit about what happens after the patient encounter. Probably the first thing that comes to mind is debriefing. It's pretty common when a student finishes visiting with a patient, they come back and they talk with the resident or the attending about what happened during the encounter. They do a case presentation or they have some kind of conversation that helps the resident and attending decide what the next steps are. You should ask the student to formally present the case to you in addition to having an informal conversation. This will give the student practice in doing formal case presentations. You can ask questions during the presentation. Ask them things like, did the patient travel recently? Uh, were they exposed to any possible sources of infection? Um, when did they first notice symptoms? And so on. And these kinds of questions will help guide the case presentation and demonstrate for the student where they need to focus. One pearl of wisdom that came to me recently from a senior physician is that if he could, he would tell every incoming intern and medical student that the case presentation is not about presenting everything they know about the patient or everything they know about the possible diseases or conditions they're considering for the differential. Instead, the case presentation is about selecting the facts, the history, and the other information that's necessary to determine the diagnosis and or plan of care for the patient. Making selective determinations 
about the information to include in a presentation requires some level of knowledge and experience. And again, this is why it's important to help guide the student's presentation, especially before they present to an attending. And you definitely want to encourage the student to present to the attending as well. It may ratchet up the nervousness factor for them, but it will definitely give them additional opportunities to present and get constructive feedback on their case presentations. And speaking of feedback, you always want to take the opportunity after a clinical encounter or at some point during a shift to offer formative feedback to the student. You want to be honest, but you're going to be helpful. It's always easy to start by telling the student something you thought they did really well. But you must also include something the student needs to work on. So for example, you could tell the student, I thought the way that you questioned this particular patient about some very sensitive information was very kind and empathetic. You apologize for having to ask sensitive questions and this seemed to me to build a good rapport with the patient, to build trust with the patient. At the same time, you can comment on perhaps how they phrased or framed the questions. Perhaps certain questions were asked in a yes-no manner and eclipsed finding out the necessary information from the patient. And this would also point out to the student that how you phrase your questions is as important as asking the question to begin with. And you can always ask your student, how can you help? How can I help you to become better at what you're doing in this clerkship or this sub-internship um, if you're not sure how to ask certain questions of patient, patients? Let's brainstorm how we can do that better. Let's watch certain physicians that we know who do an excellent job with teasing out information when they're taking a history of present illness, for example, from a patient. Having a conversation about how you can help is also a great way to build rapport with the learner. Um, it also leads ordinarily to a conversation about developing learning goals as you ask the student what they think went well and what they'd like to work on and you offer your own guidance, this can develop into a discussion about building a, learn, a set of learning goals or a plan for future learning or what their next steps for learning will be in the next clerkship or experience. I hope these tips for teaching in a clinical setting were helpful. If you would like additional support for teaching, uh, I'm happy to help you. Just give me a call or send me an email.